Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joe's Ventures, and today we're going to be doing part 41 of our Planet Zoo uh, mod showcases, and this will be the first from the latest update, the North American Animal Pack, so we've got a few animals that have been modi uh, modified from that, also some other ones that were working okay, so this is going to be pretty, pretty awesome, so... We're going to be starting, we've got a bunch of new fishes today, so I'm quite excited to get stuck into that. So, we're going to be starting with, this was by Seth and uh, Buffzu, who is very, very uh, renowned for their fishies. We've got the Yellowtail Blue Damselfish, that we'll be starting with. So really cool, wonderful guys here. So as we can see here, this is uh, also known as the Yellowtail Blue Damsel, or the Goldtail Damsel. They're a very, very uh, small, popular aquarium fish that is found in the saltwater uh, waters of the Indo-Pacific. And these guys are a pretty small marine fish. They can get to about uh, 2.8 to 3 inches long, so I believe that's about 5 centimeters or 10 centimeters, something like that. I don't know the exact conversion in my head. But these guys uh, prefer to live in densely uh, populated coral groupings within the sheltered lagoons and uh, inshore reefs. So places like atolls would be perfect for them. And they generally like to stay at depths between 3 and 52 feet or 1 to 16 meters. So they're very shallow water fish. So these guys in the wild, the males will uh, have their own territories that are located next to a uh, nesting site where each territory will contain eggs from the previous female, and then the females will swim around expecting and, uh, inspecting each male's territory and uh, before choosing one based on its size and the number of eggs in its territory. And as part of this evaluation, the female will display a light ring around her eyes and the male will respond in, a, in his own display. So that would be cool. The next day, the female will spawn with the chosen male, and an adult individual male can have up to 10,000 eggs from different females. So it's basically, females will lay them and then they head out and then the male will take care of them. And the males will often abound in their territories and claim territories with more eggs. And this may be a pair more favorable for the females. So sometimes they might just leave. They're not particularly good fathers or good mothers either, but you can't really blame them. So the eggs will hatch about after four days and depending on the temperature and the male is responsible for guarding and caring for the eggs. And the subsequent larval stage after that will be between 10 to 50 days, depending on the temperature. So, another cool about these guys is these guys have chromatophores. So, you've probably heard about these in octopus. So, they can change their color in response to external stimuli or their um, outer world. So, when they're stressed, they can turn darker to conserve energy. And they are kind of social. Adults are usually found alone or in pairs, while the juveniles remain in small groups. And they are omnivorous, so they will feed on plankton, algae, and small bethnic crustaceans, so just anything small enough to get their males around. And they are pretty popular aquarium fish, since they will uh, do pretty well in soft uh, uh, tanks, so they're quite uh, low price as well, so they do quite well. They like live rocks, and um, 30 gallons is typically recommended for uh, these guys to permanently house them, and they can live up to uh, 15 years, uh, which is pretty cool. And yeah, they have been bred, uh, breed readily in captivity, so it's very easy to not take them out of the uh, wild, which is always a good thing, because when you can, avoiding wild caught animals is always good. Let's see if we can find more of these guys. I think they're all hanging out there, but yeah, that was done by Seth and Buffsu. Really nice little fish. And we have got the next one. So this is not by one, two, three, but we've got four fishes by Seth and Buffsu. But this one also was done by bit golem so i believe that might be an abort model we have got the red lionfish so another another cool fishy let's see if we can find one diving uh not today but anyway oh there's one let's have a look at you dive. look at this wonderful guy love a good fish so the red lionfish also is um also known as scientific name as petaurus volatans they are a venomous coral reef fish that is from the family uh, Scorpinidae and it is mainly native to the Indo-Pacific region so that's around the Indian and Pacific Ocean but it's been introduced into the Caribbean and also along the east coast of the United States where they've become a very very prevalent invasive species so um, the main difference between these guys and the uh, Petaurus miles uh, 
is that they have these red uh, stripe patterns with a red maroon or brown stripes you see here and the adults can grow as large as 47 centimeters or about 18.5 inches in length and make it one of the largest species of lionfish in the world while the juveniles are typically shorter than one inch or two and a half centimeters and the average uh, red lionfish will live for about 10 years and they have these large venomous spines that you can see here uh, that is kind of similar to a lion's mane so that's where they get the name lionfish and these venomous spines make them pretty much uh, inedible and deter the most potential predators so it's also pretty interesting and uh, these guys reproduce monthly and are able to quickly disperse uh, during their larval stage which uh, from their expansion in invasive regions so that's partly why they've become so invasive is because they're such fast breeders and there is no definitive predators of these guys known and many organizations have been trying to promote the harvest of these guys because they do damage a lot of other ecosystems especially in uh, the new world around uh, the Caribbean and the East Coast of the United States and they want to keep them as low as possible these guys are a mainly solitary species and the only only time they aggregate is usually with uh, male and several females where they come around and breed they are um, gonochromatic I believe you pronounce it and they only show sexual dimorphism during a reproduction where they do all sorts of different kinds of uh, displays so they'll do like sidewinding following and leading and they're mostly nocturnal so that leads to the behavior typically around nightfall so not often observed and then after courtship the female relate, uh, will release two egg masses which is fertilized by the male uh, before the floating to the surface and they will attach to identical rocks uh, intertidal rocks or corals before hatching and during one mating season a female can lay 30,000 uh, eggs and it's also been observed that she will lay them in more and water, uh, warmer months so that tells you how quickly these guys can become invasive even like only a couple hundred of them survive That'll be very, very bad on the ecosystems. Let's see if we can find another one swimming. I think they're all over there. Let's, let's have a look at this one over here. What are you doing? Having a good time? A wonderful fellow. <laughs> so as I mentioned, these guys have uh, these dorsal spines that are used for defense. When threatened, they'll often face the attack in an upside down posture to bring its spines to you. But luckily, it's not fatal to humans, but it will cause extreme pain and possibly headaches, vomiting, and breeding difficulties. And uh, so very be careful if you own a lionfish or go diving and see one. Don't touch them. But there is a common treatment of soaking the affected area in hot water, and there are very few hospitals that carry specific treatments. However, immediate emergency medical attention, uh, attention is strongly recommended, especially if a person is more sensitive to uh, venom than others. So some people are more sensitive than others, so you got to be careful. So, these guys, they've pretty much no predators. Uh, they have been um, observed in the stomachs of tiger groupers in um, and Nasura in the Bahamas. But they are critically endangered and therefore highly unlikely to be a prolific predator. In the native range, there are two species of uh, moray, uh, moray eels that have been found preying on lionfish. And the bobbit worm has uh, been filmed uh, preying upon lionfish in Indonesia. And they are in themselves voracious feeders. That's part of the reason they're considered such a bad invasive species. They are so uh, voracious and they'll eat pretty much anything they get their mouths around. And they will hunt primarily uh, late afternoon to dawn. And they have high uh, rates of prey consumption. And as they become more abundant, they become a big threat to these ecosystems as they outcompete similar fish. And having a very diet, they'll eat pretty much anything. And yeah, so if you guys want to do a little bit of conservation work and you're a diver go out and kill as many of these as possible if you live in Caribbean or in the eastern uh, coast of the US so yeah really really wonderful animal here again made by Seth and Buffsu and a little bit from Bit Golem so that'll be our second fish now we're moving on to our second to last fish but definitely not the uh, least probably one of the most famous fish because of one Pixar movie but we have got another cool little guy we have got the Regal Blue Tang by Seth and Buff Sue again. Hopefully the guys don't do too much. Um, so these guys are a species of Indo-Pacific sturgeon fish. So these are found in the Indian Pacific Ocean, just like the other two. And they are a popular fish, of course. And oh, what happened there? Oh, anyway, let's find out one diving. Well, let's see if we can find another one. 
while we talk about them. I think they're going for food now. But yeah, these guys are the only member of their genus, uh, Paracolintus, I believe the name, but they have all sorts of different names. They're called Regal Tang, Blue Tang, uh, Royal Blue Tang, Hippo Tang, uh, Flagtail Sturgeon Fish, uh, Blue Sturgeon Fish, or the Blue Regal Blue Tang. Uh, Pacific Regal Blue Tang. So they have a lot of different names. So you can see those guys uh, have like a royal blue body, a really, really interesting color that makes them popular in the aquariums. Um, they also have this uh, black palette design there, also with the yellow tail. They have uh, the longer body uh, is yellow in the western central uh, Indian Ocean. And they can grow up to about 30 centimeters long. Let's see if we can find another one swimming. Must be some over here. We'll talk about these guys. So these guys get about 30 centimeters long and adults will weigh typically about 600 grams or 21 ounces with males in general being larger than the females. And these fish as you can see if you look at them at the front they're rather flat like a pancake and they have this real circular body shape, uh, small scales and a pointed nose. They also have 9 dorsal spikes, uh, 27 to 26 to 28 soft rays and 3 anal spikes and 20 to 24 anal soft yellow uh, rays so you can see that there so as i mentioned these guys can be found in the indo-pacific they can be found in the philippines india indonesia japan also the great barrier reef of australia new caledonia samoa east asia and sri lanka where they found a lot of these guys where they're often collected for um the aquarium trade they also live in pairs or small gr groups of about eight to fourteen individuals they can also be found near cauliflower cor corals and on the seaweed side of coral reefs so uh, luckily they consider least concern though, but we'll get into that. So as juveniles, these guys will feed primarily on plankton, and adults are typically more omnivorous, so they'll feed on both uh, plankton, but also graze on algae. Spawning for these guys usually occurs during the late afternoon and evening hours, and this uh, event is indicated by a change of color from the uniform dark blue to a pale blue. And these fish are important for coral health because they eat algae that may otherwise choke other species by being overgrown. So yeah, these guys, are in their life cycle, they have males, they will aggressively court the females in a school. And they'll lead to a quick uh, upward spawning rush towards the surface of the water where the eggs and sperm are released. So it kind of goes at the top. The eggs are pretty small and they reach about 0.8 millimeters or 132 uh, uh, of an inch. Uh, in diameter and the eggs are pelagic each containing a single droplet of oil for flotation and the fertilized eggs will hatch within uh, 24 hours uh, releasing small translucent larvae with like silvery uh, abdomens and things and they will reach sexual maturity at about 9 to 12 months of age once they get back to the uh, land and they have not been bred in captivity sadly which is a big issue because they're very popular um, aquarium fish but also a bait fish as well but very, very easy for the wild populations to get overfished and over uh, collected as uh, people want more because supply and demand. Uh, there's no captive breeding. So, pretty much every uh, regal blue tang uh, in, in a tank that you've seen is a wild caught one. And there's just no way to really breed them in captivity as we know of so far. So, that's really all we got. But um, these guys are likely considered least concerned, very, very common. But they're. Of course, with climate change and the issues with coral reefs that's going to be affecting all of these tropical species we've mentioned, um, we've got to be very careful of that because corals are pretty much going to be dying at like huge bleaching events and stuff like that. And you may remember this guy from Finding Dory, um, uh, Finding Nemo, I mean, and she plays, uh, that's Dory, so that's played by Alan Generous. don't know where that, uh, where she plays that um, Dory, the... Uh, the blue tang with the short-term memory loss you guys remember her you've probably all seen that movie i'm sure that's inspired a lot of marine biologists really cool fish regardless and speaking of finding nemo we've got nemo on the next one here so we've got a really cool species of fish here we have got the um oscillurus clownfish also done by seth and buff Sue. so this will be the last one done by seth and buff Sue. um these are also known as the common clownfish or the false Bakura clownfish. They are a marine fish that includes, uh, is found in the family um, Promiseridae, which includes clownfish and damselfish. And these guys are found in different colors uh, depending where they're located. So often you'll find black ones with white bands 
near Northern Australia, Southeast Asia, and Japan. Or the orange or red brown ones that you see here um, have these three similar bands, which is pretty cool. And uh, they can be distinguished from other species because they have the number of pectoral rays and dorsal spines, that's by the way. And uh, they're not particularly big species, they can get to about 110 millimeters long, so that's about a little over 10 centimeters. And like many other fish species, the females are larger than the males. And the life cycle of these guys uh, varies whether they reside in surface or the bottom of the ocean. And when they initially hatch, uh, they reside near the surface. However, when they enter into the juvenile state, they travel down to the bottom to find a host aquarium. Uh, anemone, I mean. You don't find aquariums out in the wild. And once they find the anemone, they form a symbiotic relationship with them. So to talk about more of this um, relationship that they have with... Let's see if we can find one out swimming here. There we are. To talk more about this relationship that they have with anemones, it's a um, symbiotic relationship. So the clownfish benefit, especially if they live in a small group, they benefit from having a safe home, they benefit from cleaning the anemone and food and things like that. But the anemone also benefits from the um, protection, also the nutrients that comes from the clownfish will get put back into the anemone, gets cleaned. There's a mutual benefit to both species, so that's why it's symbiotic. And why it's very important if you want to keep these in a tank, you need a good anemone. So as I mentioned, these guys are a small fish, they get it to about 11 centimeters or 4.3 inches, and they have this generally stocky appearance with this uh, red, uh, orangey red and these three white bands going down them, along with the uh, black rims to their uh, fins, so it's pretty cool. And uh, they can be found in the Western Pacific Ocean, and they're found in Northern Australia, Southeast Asia, and Japan. And they are a diurnal fish, and they're also, uh, this is a technical term, a pro prodrogynous uh, hermaphrodite. That means the male can change sex to female during its life, and this is due to dominance. So what will happen is they'll live in a harem, and they each have a social specific rank. So there's like the oldest female, and then the youngest male, and the next goes from biggest to smallest. So what will happen is if the oldest female dies, the next largest male, will, or the next largest uh, fish, will grow up and kind of get bigger and become a female to replace her. And then the next largest fish will become the male that breeds with uh, the largest female. So kind of just like a conveyor belt, which is really, really interesting. Uh, fish are really weird like that. So as I mentioned, they live with uh, sea anemones for shelter. Uh, they provide them with protection for the fish in their nests. And also the health of the sea anemone, they clean it and uh, provide protection with the fish. And um, also, um, clownfish can also be interpreted as like a lure to bring uh, other fish in so the anemone can eat it. So there's definitely a um, symbiotic relationship going on there. So as I mentioned, they have a really, really interesting like social uh, uh, implications and social structure. But they also uh, feed on plankton and algae, but they are considered... Uh, omnivorous so they'll feed basically is affecting on the hierarchy since the small, smaller less dominant fish face aggression from the larger more aggressive ones they tend to have less energy to forage for food and they will usually not eat as much as the big fish will and due to this reduced in, uh, energy they'll have increased danger to face when they leave their anemone since they are smaller in other words basically the largest fish will usually travel farther than the smaller fish and generally they'll feed on algae uh, copepods and zooplankton that's pretty cool so as they, sp we don't know how much about they spawn, but these guys are monogamous mating systems and are territorial for their anemones. So the males will become most aggressive during spawning and the male behavior also changes to attack the females where they bite and chase them. And during spawning, the male prepares a nest near the an anemone, where you probably see this in a Finding Nemo. And uh, where the female will come and fertilize, uh, female will come lay her eggs and then the male will come fertilize them. And then uh, he will care for them and kind of like farm them. Which is pretty cool, really interesting species. And in nature, uh, you can find these guys, uh, not nature, you can find them hosted in with different species and anemones. Uh, but in captivity in a reef one, they often will be found in other species just because uh, mainly what's available. They will find an enemy that they can live in and be fine. And a very popular uh, fish in the pet trade because of Finding Nemo, but luckily can be bred in captivity. Uh, so that's good. And. There isn't another issue because of the high demand for little Nemos. Um, there is 
a lot of demand, so that can mean collection from the wild, which can be very, very dangerous for the population. But luckily they're doing okay. Uh, I believe they're considered least concern. Uh, or something similar to that. So yeah, really, really cool species regardless. I do like these little fishies. So yeah, that was by Seth and Buffsu. So next one we probably won't go into too much detail about, because I've already mentioned them in a couple episodes. But we've got an update to the... Uh, Beluga Sturgeon. This was by uh, Janora Pizza, Buffsu, and comes from Fishing Planet. Oh, the wrong one there. There we are. These guys are wonderful. This was uh, like a double update. So this was updated because of the model was improved, because the old one was Endless Ocean. This one's Fishing Planet, which is a lot newer. But also it's been added to the alligator rig rather than the caiman rig. So they don't look so out of place and floating. Still really cool to see them regardless. So I've already talked about this guy, but we'll just quickly go over it. So the these guys are a fish, uh, one of the largest, I believe the large freshwater fish. They live in the Caspian and uh, Black Sea basins. Uh, and are the third most massive living species of bony fish. Or I believe second only really to like Mola Molas, which is pretty cool. So these guys are pretty, pretty huge. They can, the largest accepted record from a female was uh, about 1,571 kilograms or 3,463 pounds and 7.2 meters long or 23.7 feet, uh, 23 feet, 7 inches. But then when other specimens weighed a little bit less than that, that's basically the largest accepted record. But it's believed on average they could get a little under 500 kgs. Um, I mean a little over a thousand kgs, but they usually vary a lot in their lives. So today the mature uh, beluga sturgeons usually get to about 142 to 328 uh, centimeters or 4 foot 8 to 10 foot 9 and weigh between 19 and 264 kilograms. Uh, just because we've killed all these super large individuals and they take a long time to grow. So these guys are androgynous spawnings as I mentioned, so they migrate up river or upstream into rivers to uh, spawn. Well, they'll where they find these clean hard substrates where they kind of dig them out and uh, fertilize their eggs. And they can be found up to 1,700 kilometers upstream, depending on the population. Other populations will spawn just 100 kilometers in. So they kind of just do as they do and then they journey back into the Black Sea and do it back again. So males will generally become uh, sexually mature at about six, 12 to 16 years old, but the females will become sexually mature at 16 to 22 years old. So very, very big animals, very slow spawners. Uh, they will spawn every four to seven years, and one time uh, the beluga sturgeons could migrate up to a thousand kilometers upstream, but dams and almost m every major tributary in Europe has or um, Eurasia has kind of restricted that. But yeah, so these guys are pelagic predators, they're apex predators. Uh, they feed on, juveniles will feed on bethnic invertebrates and as they grow and they get bigger and bigger at about 8 to 10 centimeters long they become piscivorous so they eat a lot of fish and different diets will be observed throughout their range so as they get bigger and bigger and bigger they will eat a greater diversity of large fish and also eat things like um, mollusks and crustaceans also aquatic birds and young uh, Caspian seals that's pretty interesting so let's have a look at the other one he's going to try and come out of the water let's go have a look at one of guys Look at you, aren't you wonderful? So yeah, these guys are also used as uh, considered the delicacy, and the flesh of these guys is not particularly renowned, but they are um, kind of a use for caviar. They liked uh, the caviar of these guys. It's very very popular food, and these guys are sadly listed as critically endangered. They are protected species, and they are very heavily restricted. So, um, also the United States Fish and Wildlife has banned uh, imports of beluga caviar and other products from the Caspian Sea since 2005. And luckily they are being bred um, in the uh, sturgeon aqua farms in Florida, where they will make the caviar and are legally able to make it. And um, since 2017, these guys have luckily also been helping with wild populations. They will help, they've been helping with reconstruction efforts and helping um, populations uh, reseed themselves where they have produced over 160,000 fertilized eggs in the Caspian Sea region and releasing them. See, even business can help uh, conservation, which is always really awesome. But yeah, really interesting animal. I've already covered this guy. If you want to go back to the episode where I covered it, it must be a few episodes ago. I don't distinctly remember, but you can go have a look at that. I just wanted to show him off because he looks so nice and pretty. Wouldn't you agree? 
So yeah, we're going to be moving on to our next animal now. So this is another bird we've got from uh, Ron May Ron. We all know her. Uh, we her, she does her awesome birds, but this time she's done not as done a pheasant. Oh, she it technically is a kind of a pheasant, but that kind of group. But is a grouse this time. We have got the Eurasian Capricale uh, by Ron May Ron Oriana. So let's have a look. We'll have a look at the wonderful male here. So. These, this is the Western Capricale, also known as the Eurasian Capricale, or the Heathercock, or Cock of the Woods. So, there are the largest extant grouse species, and the heaviest known individual recorded in captivity weighed about 7 kilograms, or about 16 pounds, and are found pretty much all across Europe and the Paleoarctic, or Paleoarctic uh, where they are primar primarily ground-dwelling birds, and they have ex very extreme sexual dimorphism, with the males being nearly twice the size of the females and are renowned for their um, courtship displays. And they are generally considered least concerned, which is good, although the populations in Central Europe have been declining and potentially escapated from certain areas just because of hunting. So um, these guys, as I mentioned, pretty huge, very, very huge dimorphism. So you can see the males here, the cocks, or the males, typically range from 74 to 85 centimeters, or 29 to 33 inches in length, with a wingspan of 90 to 125 centimeters, or about 35 to 49 inches, with an average weight of about 4.1 kilograms or 9 pounds 1 ounce and the largest wild cocks have been known to reach about 100 centimeters in our length and uh, 6.7 uh, kilograms of weight as I mentioned the largest captive specimen was 7.2 kilograms so the females are much smaller and they're also much more drab we'll have a look at her if we can spot one we'll spot her so you can see in comparison much more drab so um these guys weigh about half as much as the uh, cock. They, uh, the hens will generally get about 54 to 64 centimeters uh, in length, or 21 to 25 inches. The females have a 70 centimeter wingspan, or 28 inches, and weigh between 1.5 to 2.5 kilograms, which is 3 pounds, uh, seven uh, 3 pounds 5 ounces to 5 pounds 8 ounces, and on average about 1.8 uh, kilograms, or 3 pounds 15 ounces. So you can see they have much more drab, got these wonderful feathers here. They also have this white spot on their uh, wing brown, you can see here. And they also have feathered legs, which I don't think has been that worldly rendered here, where they have like a snowshoe effect. Really, really pretty cool. And you can see these small chicks here, they've got this really cool cryptic coloration uh, that is used as passive protection against predators. And usually about the age of three months old in large summer, they will molt and get their adult plumage. And their eggs are about the same size and form as chicken eggs, but are more sp uh, speckled with brown spots. It's so really, really cool regardless. We'll have a look at the male while we're talking about them. Really, really cool. So these guys are a non-migratory species. So they breed around northern parts of Europe and the Paleoarctic in mature carnivore forests with diverse species composition and a relatively open canopy structure. So at one time, they could be found in taiga forests all over the Paleoarctic, uh, the Paleoarctic, and in cold uh, temp temperate latitudes and conifer forest belt in the mountain ranges of warm temporal Europe. And the Scottish population has become extinct, but was reintroduced uh, from the Sweden population. And it was considered on the red list for some areas because of the mass deforestation that happened in Europe. So there are some populations that have been coming back, so that's very, very good. The most serious threat to these guys, as I mentioned, is the habitat degradation, since they need these really diverse native forests uh, and not do well in these, like, simple pine plantations. They really need that complex. And also birds colliding with fences uh, erected to keep deer out of young plantations. That's another big issue. But luckily they aren't considered too endangered. They, uh, they have an estimated range of about 10 uh, million square kilometers. That's the largest estimation, and the population is believed to be 1.5 to 2 million individuals in Europe alone. But there is some evidence of a decline, but the overall species has not been considered um, decline enough to be much of a worry, so they're considered least concern. In some places, I mentioned in Scotland, they became extinct, but have been reintroduced. Um, they are, uh, live, as I mentioned, like these kind of forests. They're not very elegant flyers, flyers so they tend to walk around and do their thing. Um, in the lowlands, they will kind of like graze and kind of just find whatever they can. Uh, they usually have these territories that they maintain. Um, spring territory for these guys can be about 25 uh, hectares or 62 acres per bird. Uh, and they have, uh, can never been found in particularly high densities because they maintain these territories. 
For an adult cock, uh, is strongly territorial and has these really large hectares. Uh, for uh, can be up to 50 to 60 uh, hectares or 120 to 150 acres in uh, proper habitat. And hen ones are usually smaller, so it'd be about 40 hectares or 100 hectares, so this is usually like in winter. And the annual range can be several kilometers or hundreds of hectares where storms and heavy rainfall can force the birds at different altitudes. So these guys are also diurnal, so they kind of just do what they want during the day, or they'll sleep at the trees and things like that. And they have a pretty complex diet. They have eat a variety of foods. They eat a bunch of buds, leaves, uh, berries, insects, grasses, and also conifer needles in the winter, where they will kind of just leave their droppings and things. They have a highly specialized herbivore as well, where they'll feed almost exclusively on blueberry leaves and berries, and also some grass seeds and fresh shoots in the summertime. So the young chicks are also very depend uh, dependent on uh, protein-rich foods and their first weeks of life and they will eat mainly insects um, and they uh, like other birds they have uh, they will eat uh, gastrulus that will collect in their uh, gizzard that will allow them to help uh, better digest these foods and they also have uh, two appendixes uh, which is pretty cool they also um, house uh, symbiotic bacteria that helps them digest their food so these guys uh, We'll start breeding in the spring, so that'll be May to June. Uh, March to April and last until May to June, so that's kind of how it goes. And the female, they have a lift breeding system where the males will kind of come and display and fight each other and the females will come watch and pick their males. So that's kind of what they'll do. And um, after three days after copulation, the hen will start laying eggs. At about 10 days, the clutch is full. The average clutch size is about 8 eggs, but can be up to 12 and really only 4 to 5. They will brood about 26 to 28 days. It'll depend on the weather and altitude. And at the beginning of the brooding season, they're very sensitive and will need leave the nest quickly. And towards the end, the tolerance uh, distributes so that the females will be more likely to kind of stay bare their nest if they've invested more time in their babies. And um, these guys are born uh, precocial, so that means they're covered in down feathers, but are not able to maintain their body temperature. So in cold, rainy weather, they'll need to sit under their mum for every few minutes uh, or all night. Where they'll go out and find insects, they'll find caterpillars, uh, ants, beetles, pretty much anything they can. Or they'll grow rapidly on this protein diet. And at age of three to four weeks, they're able to do their first flights. And at age six weeks, they're able to fully maintain their body temperature. And at about three months, they will molt their uh, baby plumage and move into their adult plumage. And yeah, these guys are uh, eaten by quite a few animals. We'll have a look at the female while we're talking about her. See, this is over there. Well, that's not what I wanted to do. So, yeah, these guys are taken by all sorts of different species of this prey, such as Eurasian lynx, grey wolf, pine muttons, brown bears, wild boars, red foxes, and pretty much anything will take their eggs. Also in Sweden, they will be also hunted by golden eagles and eagle owls, um, for example. And they're a traditional grain bird, so they're typically hunted around. That's part of the reason why they were introduced back into Scotland, because they are a game bird and people like uh, shooting them. So that's kind of a double-edged sword. People wanted the hunting them. And then we also get Capricorni back in Scotland, where they used to live. Really, really awesome regardless. So they often had, um, become extinct in some areas because of trophy hunting. So there has been some uh, people trying to bring them back to these areas, uh, both for conservation reasons and also for commercial hunting. So that's also cool regardless. So yeah, really nice Capricorn. Um Rihanna always does a good job with her birds, I think. So now we're going to be moving to... We've got another one that I've covered before, so we will go over this one quickly. We have got the Nile Crocodile. This was done by Mega Rex Gaming and uh, Leaf ported it as well. So we'll go have a look at that. It's based off the alligator model. Let's have a look. Look at you. I think that looks much nicer. Look at that. It came out well with the alligator. So these uh, guys are the, a large crocodilian that is native to the freshwater habitats of Africa, uh, which is present in about 26 different countries, uh, widely throughout sub-Saharan Africa, and also be found in Nile, hence the name Nile Crocodile. So these guys are found in all sorts of aquatic habitats, such as marshlands, lakes, rivers, swamps, things like that. Also can be found, I believe, in uh, estuaries. So they are able, although they're capable of living in saline environments, their species is really found in salt water, but can inhabit deltas and things like that. 
and they once ranged uh, far north throughout the Nile, as far north as the Nile Delta. And on average, these guys get pretty big. They get between 3.5 and 5 meters long, or 11.5 uh, and 16.4 feet long. And weights of about 225 or 750 kilograms, or between 500 and 1,650 uh, pounds. However, there have been exceptional individuals that have been 6.1 meters long and weighed up to 1,089 kilos, or 2,400 pounds. And is the largest freshwater predator in Africa, and is considered the second largest living uh, reptile after the uh, saltwater crocodile. And also, there is some pretty strong sexual dimorphism. The males are on average 30% larger than the, uh, 30 percent smaller than the males. And they have these really thick armored skin, as you can see here. I'm going to have a look at the babies while we're talking about them. Who doesn't love a good baby croco? So these guys are considered extremely uh, opportunistic apex predators. A very aggressive species. They're capable of eating pretty much anything. Um, as long as you're not an elephant, you're basically a, f a food item for these guys. They'll eat... Uh, just anything, uh, wildebeest, uh, lions, whatever. Uh, the diet will mainly consist of fish, reptiles, birds, and mammals, and they're ambush predators, so they'll wait for hours, uh, days, or even weeks for a moment to attack, where they'll come out and lunge out of the water and bite them. They have a very, very strong bite, which they use to um, immobilize these animals, and sharp conical teeth that they use to punch a prey. And they can also apply um, this level of force for a very long time which helps uh, sink their teeth in their prey while they're struggling. So, also about these guys, uh, Nile crocodiles are actually pretty social comparatively. They will share basking spots uh, and la with large food sources such as calls of fish or big carcasses. They have a strict hierarchy though that is determined by their size. And the largest, oldest males will have be the top of the hierarchy and have primarily access to the best basking spots and also the best food. And crocodiles will tend to respect this order and can have, if not, there'll be violent uh, repercussions, including pretty much violence or death. But what's really cool about crocodiles as well, they're very great mothers. They lay eggs, which are guarded by the females. The hatchings are protected by their mother for a period of time. Female crocs are very, very protective, which is awesome. And um, they are not fed by the mother, so the babies, as they're young, they will feed on insects, so small amphibians. And as they get older, they'll become... A lot more eating of mammals and larger birds similar to their parents as we can see here but yeah these guys are also uh, one of the most dangerous species of crocodile and are responsible for hundreds of humans deaths every year mainly just because they're so common but they're also very aggressive so you got to be very very careful with that of course it's still a really wonderful animal and hope some good protections are in place and there have been some regional extinctions but overall they're considered least concerned they're doing okay so yeah, nothing too bad here. Really, really wonderful guy. Oh, a lot of these mods I've been covering today. Kind of updates. And this one was, this one was. And now the next one. Uh, second to last, we're moving on to the big cats. So this one was done by Havoc and Good Boy. We have got the Sumatran Tiger. So it really, really looks nice, doesn't he? So the Sumatran tiger is a population of the subspecies Panthera tigris sodata. So it's considered kind of like the uh, Sundanese tiger or from the Sundalans uh, from Sumatra. And these guys are critically endangered and are listed uh, by the IUCN with an estimated population of about 400 to 600 individuals with no population, subpopulation larger than 50, which is kind of sad. So the only surviving population of tigers from the Sunda Islands that there have been reports of, of course, almost like Bigfoot type reports, but the Javan and Bali tiger have been considered extinct. And um, these guys became isolated from other tiger populations about the Pleistocene or Holocene border about 12,000 to 6,000 years ago. And they have become genetically isolated from the mainland tigers, which can be evident in their DNA, which is still pretty cool. But there has been some evidence of some, there's some restricted um, gene flow between these guys, mainly just because of the distance. But still pretty interesting regardless. Um, these guys are also believed to be some of the smallest tigers, uh, probably the smallest living tiger. So males are about 2.2 .2 to 2.55 uh, meters or 18 to 100 inches, 87 to 100 inches long and about um, head to body length. 
So the greatest skull size of these guys is about uh, 295 to 355 centimeters or 11 to 13 uh, inches and weigh between 100 and 140 kilograms or 220 and 310 pounds. So that's about my size. Uh, well, not the head, but just the weight. So that is a small tiger. It's the size of a large person. Um, the females are generally quite a bit smaller. They get between 75 to 110 kilograms or 165 to 243 pounds and uh, measure about uh, their skull will measure about or they their body will measure about 2.15 to 2.30 uh, meters or 85 to 91 inches in length and have a slightly smaller skull as well generally females tigers are smaller than the male tigers they're having a good time there let's see if we can have a look at the female here and she has a really nice coloration don't she so these guys live in very small fragmented areas across uh, Sumatra so mainly like coastal lowland forests and mainly just small patches where they can so up to three tigers can live in an area of 100 square kilometers and the, in 1978 the population was estimated to be about a thousand individuals but now they're considered about uh, in 2017 the latest populations was estimated between 618 and 290 so it's possible there's no less than definitely less than 700 tigers in their natural range these guys are not too different ecologically from uh, tig normal tigers they live in these forest areas where they'll hunt pretty much anything they can. Some of the species they'll eat includes uh, great uh, argus, uh, macaques, Malayan tapirs, Malayan um, porcupine, uh, mouse deer, sambar deer, pretty much anything they can get their mouths around. Um, but yeah, they will often use areas of logging. They'll live and uh, find adequate vegetation where they will hide and look for prey to hunt. Still really cool animals. Let's have a look at them male here really really beautiful so the main threats of these guys is palm oil uh, plantations that have basically uh, decimated heaps and heaps of forest around uh, southeast asia which is very uh, sad it's just blown up and they've destroyed like this huge deforestation issues also um other plantations uh hunting has also been another issue because of snare traps for other species but also poachers wanting to get these guys because we all know um in uh southeast asian cultures tiger often eating tiger boats like traditional chinese medicine another very bad thing but um also snare traps but luckily they are considered um appendix ones so you're not allowed to trade them any any trade of these guys is illegal and there have been uh efforts to try and create like tiger friendly predicted uh, areas also reintroducing them to different areas just trying their best i i've got a lot of faith in these guys because people love tigers but um as of 2013 there's about 375 uh, captive tigers in a global stud book and usually managed between um 50 of them were housed in 14 zoos across australia and new zealand so the main uh tigers you'll see in new zealand are sumatran tigers and um from the founders but yeah, still really, really cool animals, and I love them. Even though they're the smallest tiger, they're still one of the greatest. I do like myself a good Sumatran tiger. Great example of insular dwarfism as well. But yeah, really cool guys. So that was that was done by Havoc and Gaboy. Next one was done by the same two um, dream team, Havoc and Gaboy. But we have got the Northern Lion. So that's really, really cool here. Where's the male? There he is. So... This is one of the two subspecies of the uh, African lion. So this is uh, Panthera leo leo, which is present in West Africa, uh, Northern Central Africa, and Indonesia. Where this individual is mainly based on the um, Indian individuals. So these guys are also... Uh, these. Uh, the split was resulted in a bunch of phylogenetic... Uh, science and stuff like that where they basically took all the genetics and found the diversion points so i believe the diversion point for these guys was about between 245,000 and 50,000 years ago so that's where the two populations split but there is in the central clade and also the northeastern clade there is some intermixing but in with panthera leo leo this guy here the this is meant to be an indian individual there would be not much inbreeding there or breeding with the other subspecies so this guy is also would consider the same population as the Barbary lion, as we both know look very, or well, as we all know, they look kind of very, very different. So um, 
they don't have that big mane it's partly just because of their habitat there's a thing called the bergman's rule where when animals will live in cooler habitats they kind of become a bit more um, larger and more hair and things like that you can kind of see that trend with the cape lion as well as it lived in the most southern parts of africa so that's another pretty interesting thing about them so we'll have a look at the females while we're talking about them. really really wonderful um so these guys uh these lions fur will uh, vary from light bluff, uh, light buff to dark brown with these rounded ears. Average head to body length for these guys on average is about 2.47 to 2.84 uh, meters, or 8 foot 1 to 9 foot 4, and weigh between 190, uh, 148 to 190 kilograms, or about 327 to 421 pounds, with females uh, being average smaller and lighter than the uh, males. And um, there is not really... There's a lot of difference, like, physically, but there's not really much genetic difference between, like, the Barbary and the Indian lions that you see here. It's mainly just because of their habitat. But these guys, uh, as I mentioned, lived all across um, North uh, Africa and Asia, where they're regionally extinct in areas such as uh, the um, Morocco, where the uh, Barbary lion was obviously very, very famous. Um, but also clades in West Africa that kind of all kind of generally been endangered some are regionally extinct the Indian clade is only found in Garot and um, the male Asiatic lions are actually tend to associate in uh, solitary or associate up to three males forming a loose pride where the males will hunt and rest and the females will associate up to 12 females forming a strong pride and in different places it can just depend locally there's a lot of variation between them and in Africa, they kind of hunt what you generally expect. They'll hunt uh, wildebeest, zebra, antelope, warthogs. But in um, Asia, or in India, they'll feed on porcupines, uh, chitali, uh, ningali cattle, domestic buffalo, wild boar, and also really Arabian cattle. Uh, ca uh, camels, I mean. Where they'll pretty much just, they pretty much eat what big animals they'll find locally. Let's see if we can have a look at the male again. Really, really wonderful. So... As, as much as lions generally, they're generally facing these problems um, in Africa. They're kind of killed because they uh, don't want them eating livestock, so they are managed. Um, also, their habitats are very, very fragmented, uh, fragmented, so it's very hard to maintain large populations and also good genetic diversity within these small populations. And also, trophy hunting is another big issue. Uh, poisoning um, from uh, putting chunks of meat out for lions to eat, then they'll get poisoned and die. Uh, that's another big issue, but luckily they are considered um, Appendix 1, so you don't want people... Um, African lions are considered Appendix 2, while the Indian lions are protected, so that's also good. So there have also been uh, efforts to try and create like sustainable business of trophy hunting, so people can hunt and uh, take lions responsibly. But there have been issues with lions in Garot, because um, there's a lot of like nationalism or local um, things going on there, and... The population there is about 600 and it's expanding outside the park and affecting people but they don't really want to move them because they want to be the only state that has lions in India. So it'll, probably eventually they'll either have to cull them and manage them in a population or they're going to have to uh, move them out eventually. It's just getting the trying to persuade the local governments to do that as I've covered before. But still a really really nice model and I think this came out really really well. So yeah cute little babies here as well cute little baby lion little cub a really nice job especially improvement from the frontier lion but yeah i think this would be a great place to end the video so this was done by hobbit um, havoc 1199 anger boy did another good job they do love their big cats and they always do a good job with their mods so yeah i'm gonna end this video here so let me zoom out so yeah I really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to get the little bell icon to get notified when I upload anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe, and bye bye